I am so excited to be beginning this brand new series called David. David, most of us know the stories of David. Se several of us know, or most of us know several of his stories. We know about David defeating Goliath and cutting off the head of the giant. And we know about David with Bathsheba. And that's uh, the pain of that story, the brokenness of him not being where he's supposed to be. We know about David the shepherd. We know about David the king. We even, many of us know about David the musician. Uh, the harpist who came and played beautiful music for Saul to ease his aching spirit. But we're going to, in these four weeks, we're going to unpack four lesser known but equally important stories in the life of David. And I just want to tell you, this, this is incredible, these stories that you may have missed in your life, but have such power for us to recognize who David is and why David uh, said that he was a man after his own heart. What is it about David that, that drew God's heart toward uh, the little boy, shepherd boy who grew to become king? It's an incredible story in his life as we, we find David scattered throughout the entire Bible almost it seems. By the time we get to uh, First and Second Samuel and then the Kings and Chronicles and, and, and then coming back in the Gospels and then all the letters of the New Testament. Even in the, the lineage of the faith and faithful in Hebrews, uh, David is significant. There's so much written about David. He's one of the key figures in, in the Old Testament that prepares even for the lineage of, of Jesus himself as we come up to King David and ultimately in the line of King David uh, that Jesus would become. Uh, by the time we get to the 24th chapter of 1 Samuel, David has already defeated Goliath. He has already become immensely popular throughout the kingdom of Israel. As a matter of fact, by this point, David has already escaped King Saul's uh, clutches numerous times. Saul is so jealous of David uh, for lots of good reasons. When David defeats Goliath and, and he becomes kind of a national hero as he goes up against the giant Philistine Goliath, he is now in folklore. And I mean, it's just almost impossible to get anywhere in Israel or in Judah without coming across the name of David. As a matter of fact, even Saul's son, Jonathan, has this deep heart connection, best friends with David. And, and, and when David has been helped by Ahimelech, and Saul actually kills him for helping David to flee from Saul's presence. In addition, Saul has also gotten so ravenously jealous of David that it's literally become like the, the driving force of Saul's existence. David is the bane of Saul's existence because he is certain that the blessing and the favor of God has come off of Saul and it's been placed on David. And therefore, all he can think about is getting David taken out. Now, as a, as a teenager, as a, uh, a high school student, I was a cross-country runner. and We knew that if there was a big square around a room like this, if there wasn't some kind of cone or chair or something, that when you got to the corners, as a basketball player too, we'd have to run laps around the basketball court. Everyone was notorious for cutting the corners, getting the shorter path, the quicker way. And, and David finds himself tempted in this incredible story here in the 24th chapter of First Samuel to cut corners as well. Now, I just, I just want to just tell you that I am, I am pretty good at struggling and wrestling to discover God's will. But once I discover God's will, I'm not very good at waiting for God's way. How many of you would just confess with me this morning that in life you have often been tempted to cut corners? Anybody else? And, and it may be in parenting or in vacationing or in preparation or in time or all kinds of different ways. But many of us, most of us, I would say all of us, at one time or another have been tempted to cut corners. Now that we've all confessed to our corner cutting capacity, uh, I just want to challenge us uh, with these incredibly convicting six verses. And I hope you wore your steel-toed shoes this morning because this, this message is going to stomp on your feet a little bit. It's going to step on your toes a little bit. And uh, as we prepare to dive into it, we're going to read God's Word. So I'm going to invite you to stand out of reverence for God's most precious and holy Word. At the end of the reading, I'm going to turn to you and say, this is the Word of God for the people of God. And you'll respond. All right, but louder than that because we're saying this boldly. 1 Samuel 24, starting with verse 2, going through verse 7. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all of Israel and went to seek David and his men in front of the wild goat's rocks. And when he came to the sheepfolds, by the way, where there was a cave, and Saul went in 
to relieve himself. Stay with me. Now David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of the cave. And the men of David said to him, here is the day of which the Lord said to you, behold, I will give your enemy into your hand. And you shall do to him as shall seem good to you. Then David arose and stealthily, cue Mission Impossible music, cut off the corner of Saul's robe. And afterward, David's heart was struck, his heart struck him because he had cut off the corner of Saul's robe. And he said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord. The Lord's anointed to put out my hand against him, seeing that he is the Lord's anointed. So David persuaded his men with these words and did not permit them to attack Saul. And Saul rose up and left the cave and went on his way. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. Much better. You may be seated. I just, I want to say this again. Once I know God's will... I struggle to wait for God's way. Once I feel like I know what God wants to happen, once I feel like I know where God's leading to, my temptation is if if we're going to go from here to there to there to there to there on the way to get there, I would much rather just go to there. I would much rather, once I know that this is a good book or a good movie, I want to read all the way through. I want to get to the end. I want to skip to the last chapter. I want to go through the scenes on my DVD player and jump to the last scene because I want to see how this thing ends. And I want to get right there. I don't want to go through all the mess of the rest of the story. I want to get right to here's how it gets resolved. Here's how the tension gets released. One of my favorite movies when I was a teenage boy was a little movie called The Karate Kid. The Karate Kid was about Danny LaRusso, who moves from Newark, New Jersey, out to Los Angeles, California, and he gets there, and he meets this cute girl that lives there, and he and Allie become boyfriend and girlfriend, and then he finds out that her ex-boyfriend is like the baddest dude in the school. He was the big-time karate champ, and, and so Danny LaRusso gets beat up by the former boyfriend, and he is very embarrassed, upset, frustrated. Um, this Cobra Kai fighter named Johnny Lawrence. Are you there with me? Some of you back in the movie in your mind? Okay. And I mean, I was mad. I was angry. He should get even. And then he stumbles across this wonderful old guy in the apartment complex named... Oh, you've seen it. Good for you. Mr. Miyagi. Mr. Miyagi is this karate champ, but he's bad to the bone, okay? I mean, he's got it going on, and he knows all his moves, and he begins to teach them. He says, if you will come and show up and do the work, then I will teach you how to be a karate champion, and you can compete in the big competition later this year. Danny shows up, and you remember what happens. He's so angry because he spends the whole day scrubbing floors, sanding floors, and then waxing and waxing on and off a car. And then he's painting the fence, and then he's working on painting the house. He is so irritated. He thinks Mr. Miyagi is taking advantage of him until the end of the day. And all you get, I know you're dying to see the whole movie later today, and that's fine. But I'm going to give you two and a half minutes of it right here. Check out this scene. Woo. <laughs> I know, just go pull it down on Netflix later today. You'll be fine. And uh, I love this movie. I love this scene because from this scene all the way up until the tournament, there are going to be all these moments where Daniel's son wants desperately to go on and fight. He wants to go ahead and move into this new place. I've learned now. I know how to, and I know how to. And, and at this point, he is so ready. Mr. Miyagi many times is going to be disrespected and and. Danny knows that he could take them in a fight. He knows that he is greater and he has more power and he's ready to move into that new place. He wants to cut the corner to get there quicker. And Mr. Miyagi teaches him over and over two lessons that I did not know until I was studying this message this week in preparation for walking you through this amazing story here in the 24th chapter. These six short verses in 1 Samuel 24 that really both Mr. Miyagi and David understand something that we struggle to understand. Both of them would tell us your first blank. That having a right doesn't make it right. Having a right 
doesn't make it right. Hear again the word. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of Israel and went to seek David and his men in front of the wild goat's rocks. And when he came to the sheepfolds, by the way, where there was a cave, and Saul went in to relieve himself. Now David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of the cave. And the men of David said to him, here is the day, here is the moment which the Lord said to you, behold, I will give your enemy into your hand. And you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. Now, let me just be clear. When, when, when Saul, in the first verse here, right before this, it says, Saul, when he had finished fighting the Philistines, his men told him that David was in the wilderness of En Gedi. And Saul immediately took 3,000 men and pursued David with the express purpose of killing him. I mean, this is why Saul has come here. He's come here to kill David. Saul's kingdom, everyone in the kingdom knew that, that David was already the anointed future king. Everyone knew. Jonathan, Saul's to-be son who would be the heir to the throne, even gives him his robe and all of his armor and everything he has because he knows this is going to be the future king, not me and not my father. Ultimately, Saul is so eaten up with ravenous jealousy because here's what he's heard all over the kingdom, everywhere he's gone. Saul has killed his thousands. If you're reading the NIV or in the, the NRSV or in the ESV, you will find it says, Saul has slain his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. I mean, you may have been like the one, the man, the woman, the person, the chosen, whatever it was for a season. And when that shifts off of you to someone else, there's just this jealousy on Saul that he just can't contain. He is in pursuit of David. And then the most ironic of ironic things happens. Of all the caves throughout this area, this region, this arid, dry region, Saul has all of his men stay outside of this one particular cave. And he goes in to relieve himself. Now, I'll just tell you, he's going to the bathroom. That's what that means. He's gone in. He's in his most vulnerable place. All of his, his powerful men are outside the cave. And Saul is in this place. And, and literally, he has been caught with his pants down. Or to use biblical terms, with his feet covered. That's, that's where the pants went to, I guess. The robe went to. He's gone to use the facilities. It's the, it's the biblical form of the giant porta potty, okay? I mean, this is why he's gone in there. And in the midst of this place, David's men were quick to say, this is what we've been looking for. This is, the, this is your moment. Take him out, David. We want you to be king so we can be under you as the king. David sneaks up behind Saul. I mean, you can hear the the cinematography music going behind here, the theme music, this mission impossible as he sleeks up. And instead of cutting off the head of Saul, he simply cuts off a corner of his robe. Huh. He, he relents on his way up. He may have been going up prepared to take his life, but instead he just takes the hem of his garment. As I prayed about this message this week, man, I just felt so strongly someone in earshot of my voice, someone in this room, someone watching online needs to hear this statement. A good chance does not always equal a good choice. Hear me. A good chance does not always equal a good choice. Just because the owner of the store looks away, it doesn't mean you've got your chance to steal something. It's a good chance, but it's not a good choice. For you who are married, just because you've got a good chance with someone else, it doesn't mean it's a good choice, you see. David here is presented with the perfect opportunity to take Saul's life. All those men are outside the cave. No one else is watching. Saul himself is not paying attention. He's in his most vulnerable place. A good, a good chance does not necessarily mean a good choice, friends. Someone here right now is walking with a good chance, but making a really poor choice. 
You may have the ability to get even with someone. You may have the opportunity to embarrass someone who's embarrassed you. You may have the opportunity to take something that doesn't belong to you. You may have the opportunity that no one else will seem to know. But a good chance is not the same thing as a good choice, friends. Because even if no one else sees, God sees David has good reasons to take Saul's life. Let me just be really clear. Saul, Saul's been pursuing David every day by the time we get to this story. And, and the reason he's pursuing him is to take his life. As a matter of fact, David uh, has, has been saved in the 23rd chapter by the Philistine uprising. That's the only reason David gets away. Uh, let me also be clear about this. Saul has 3,000 men that he's assembled. And these 3,000 men uh, are compared to David's 600 men. They're one to five ratio. It's good for him to take advantage of this opportunity because if they go face to face, head to head, it doesn't necessarily turn out well for David. Not only that, but these are not just any 3,000 men that Saul has, has, has brought together. It says that he drew them from all over Israel. These are the choice specimens. These are NFL players. These are Georgia's line, okay? These are tall, fast, big, strong athletes. They're chosen. They're select. There's already been one leader. David could also point to an old story that he would have known by this point in the judges. As we go, uh, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings. By the time we get to 1 and 2 Samuel, he would have known about Ehud, who was also killed while he was going to the bathroom. Hear me. Right is right, even if no one else is doing it. And wrong is wrong, even if everyone is doing it. Now, just be honest here. How many of you, like me, said to a parent growing up or as you're growing up, how many of you ever said, well, everyone's going to be there or everyone's going to do it? Go ahead, throw them up. Go ahead, just confess it. You did. I did. Everyone's going to do it. That doesn't mean that it's right. Just because everyone's going to do it. And they, the parent always said what? If everyone... Jumping off a bridge, right? It doesn't mean that it's right. It just means that everyone may be doing wrong. Having a right doesn't make it right. But the second part of this story, this incredible little story, is, is where I really want to live. And that is a little wrong. It's your second blanks here. A little wrong is still wrong. First Samuel 24, 4b through 7. Then David arose stealthily. And cut off the corner of Saul's robe. And afterward, David's heart struck him because he had cut off a corner of Saul's robe. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord. That's the Lord to my Lord, just the King Saul here. So David persuaded his men with these words and did not permit them to attack Saul. And Saul rose up and left the cave and went on his way. David later feels guilty for what he's done, even to simply cut off the corner of the robe, let alone cut off his head. I just got to be honest. If I was in that place and I was David in this moment, I think I would have cut off far more than a corner of his robe. And to be sure, every one of the men under David's control at this point wanted him to take Saul's life. David commits right here in this scripture, in this place, never to touch or harm the Lord's anointed. Two chapters later, in the 26th chapter of 1 Samuel, he's going to have the opportunity again to do that. He'll go through the camp and he'll find a spear and a water jug at the head of Saul. And he will take those things and he'll remind Saul that I could have taken your life, but all I took was these items. And, and still, I will not touch the Lord's anointed. As a matter of fact, when you flip over to the next book of the Bible, 2 Samuel chapter 1, 14 through 16, we find that David has an Amalekite. Um, young man who comes to him and brags about killing Saul. David not only is heartbroken over that happening, but he himself takes the life of the one who took Saul's life, the Lord's anointed. David's, David's men are going to proclaim over and over, the Lord's delivered him into your hands. The ends justify the means. I want you to picture this cave. 
This cavernous, large, dark cave that David and his 600 men are in all the nooks and crannies at the back of the cave. I mean, they're out of the light. They're in the shadows. Saul can't see them, but they see Saul just fine. They're back in these recesses. And David, after cutting off the corner of his robe, off of Saul's robe, says to his men, we can't touch the Lord's anointed. Now, I don't know how in the midst of this cave, David can be talking with 600 people. And Saul not hear it, but that's what the scripture says. I don't know if Saul fell asleep. Some theologians believe that Saul fell asleep after going to the bathroom and then goes to sleep. And David talks them out. Because here's the reality. You don't have to directly harm someone. Sometimes your silence and mine can bring harm to someone. We see something that's wrong and we keep silent and we let those 600 men take Saul out on our behalf. We're complicit. David says, Lord forbid that I should harm the Lord's anointed. And Lord forbid that you should either. Don't do this. When we're convicted of our wrong, it's sometimes very important that we recognize that it, we don't need to hold that inside of us. We need to get that out of us. We need to confess what that is. And who knows, God may use it to be the salvation of one or many. I want to share, I want to close with an incredible story. A pastor named F.E. Marsh, who passed away some years ago, I heard share on one occasion as he was preaching uh, about the importance of confession of sin and whenever possible restitution for the sin that was done to others. At the close of his message, a young man, a young man in his congregation, a member of his church came up with a troubled conscience and said, Pastor, you put me in a really, really bad place, a really bad fix. He said, I've wronged another and I'm ashamed to confess it or try to put it right. You see, I'm a boat builder and I've been working for a man who is incorrigible. I mean, he is, he's delinquent. He's a bad person. He's very wealthy and he doesn't pay any of us hardly anything. But I've worked for this boat builder and I've been telling him for years that he needs to come hear you preach. Now, every preacher loves that, okay? He needs to come hear you preach. He needs to hear the words you're speaking. He needs his heart can, transformed by the gospel message of Jesus. And he said, but all these years, a few years ago, I, I started building a boat of my own in, at my house. And, and this is a very wealthy man. He has tons and tons of supplies. And so each day at the end of the day, I just took a handful of his copper nails. Because if you're going to build a boat, you build with copper nails so they don't rust in the water. He said, I just took a handful of his copper nails and I've accumulated and accumulated them. And I've got them kind of stockpiled at my house. And I'm just skimming off a little. He'll never notice. He doesn't care. Well, he may care, but he won't ever notice. He said, and if I go and I confess this wrong that I've done, I try to make restitution to pay it back or to give those things back and pay for what I've already used. He said, I will ruin my witness and he will consider me a hypocrite forever. He may never come to faith because he sees the hypocrisy of who I am. The pastor said, you got a real dilemma, don't you? He said, you still got to do the right thing. After some time, one of the Sundays, the, the young man came running up to the pastor with joy in his heart and his face and his countenance had totally changed. He had been so just twisted around the axle over the whole thing. He, he came to him and he said, you won't believe this. Those three copper nails that are all those copper nails that were pressing against the conscience of my heart, they have been relieved. I went and I confessed to him what I had done. I gave the ones back that I still had and I paid for the ones that I had already used. He said, my conscience has been relieved. The pastor said, well, how did he respond when you said that to him? He said, this old infidel looked at me and he said, um, you won't believe this. But what he said to me is, George, that was the young man's name. George, I've, I've always thought you to be a hypocrite. But now I feel there's something to this Christianity. There has to be something to, to it after all. If any religion would make a dishonest workman come back and confess that they have been stealing copper nails and offer settlement for them, it must be something worth living for. He said, and you won't believe this preacher, but I got to pray with him to accept Christ. 
The pastor said, well, I need to tell this story. Would you give me your blessing to share this story with other people? Would you let me share this with other persons that need to hear this story? Because sometimes we feel like we've got to be all put together and look right and all that. And the best thing we can sometimes say is, no, I've missed the mark. I've broken my, my covenant with God. I, I've fallen short of the glory. I, I'm, I'm messed up too. And he said, well, sure you can. And Dr. Marsh had shared it the next night. And that night, a woman came up to him. He was preaching in a different city. And the woman came up and she said, I too have copper nails pressing against the conscience of my heart. And he looked at her and he said, ma'am, surely you're not a boat builder too. I mean, that would just be too ironic. And she said, no, I'm not a boat builder, but I'm a book collector. And, and a woman that I clean house for, she has tons of books. So many she would never notice any of them missing. And for years, I've just been kind of skimming books off of her shelves. And I built my own collection out of her books. And she said, I've got to make it right. She went and she took all the books she had stolen from her over the years and she placed them, took them back to the lady and she said, I'm so sorry, I'm so embarrassed. I, I just, I, it was wrong and I didn't, I let my conscience ease and I've been convicted of this that was wrong and the woman forgave me and God forgave me. <laughs> a few weeks later, the pastor was, Dr. Marsh was speaking at a school and he told these stories and, and the, the principal, of, uh, like a week later, called him and said, you're not going to believe this as a result of those copper nails that were pressing against the conscience of the heart. He said, we have had more ballpoint pens <laughs> return to classrooms and people than we could have ever dreamed by students and teachers and whoever else. Friends, this morning, let me just tell you, I believe... The reason that God says David was a man after my own heart is not because he did everything right. Look, he did a lot of things wrong. He, he in this moment, cuts off the corner of Saul's robe. He, he's going to take things that aren't his. He's going to have the Bathsheba um, affair. He's going to kill her husband. And yet God's going to call him a man after God's own heart. I believe it's this simple. David knew how to repent. David knew how to say, acknowledge when he had cut corners and done the wrong thing. And it's not that he never messed up. It's that when he messed up, he confessed it and he owned up. This morning, perhaps one of the most important messages you've ever heard would be, don't let these copper nails press against the conscience of your heart. Let them come up and come out. Because here's, here's, I love this statement by Leo Tolstoy. He said, Wrong does not cease to be wrong because the majority share in it. Friends, David had an echo chamber in that cave. Can you imagine how resonant that cave had to be with all those men gathered in, and those, those 600 warriors gathered in? This is your opportunity. Take his life. Go get him. This is how you become king. Years passed before David finally takes the throne. Years passed. Per, per, perhaps what we need to know today is that we don't become who God calls us to be by forcing our will and our way on others, but by surrendering our will and our way to God. Maybe we've been going about this the whole wrong way. We've been defeating Goliath. That's great. We've been tearing up lions and bears that have attacked the sheep. That's great. But when, when God says, wait on me, we need to wait. We need to wait for God to reveal his plan. Maybe what we need to say is as simple as the old words of this song. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him. In his presence daily live. Cause I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessing. Savior, I surrender all, and all to
to Jesus, I surrender. Lord, I give myself to Thee. Fill me with Thy love and power. Let Thy blessings fall on me. Cause I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior. I see, friends, Jesus is not looking for people that will win by power and might, but by surrendering ourselves to him. Not looking for people that will cut off Saul's head, but will simply surrender themselves to God. How about you? Are you ready to do that? Let's pray. Lord, we confess that we don't like to wait. We don't like to sand and wax the floors and cars. We don't want to paint the fences or the houses. We also confess that we've let the ends justify the means far too often in our lives. We've assumed that having a right makes it right. We have equated a good chance with a good choice, we too have stolen our own copper nails and our own fountain pens. We have cut the corners of robes and the corners of life in pursuit of what we want instead of waiting for what you want. Forgive us and remind us that things that are worth having are worth waiting for. Remind us that you've been waiting for us and that we are called to wait on the Lord. Remind us that right is right even if no one else is doing it. And that wrong is wrong even if everyone else is doing it. Help us to realize what doors you are opening and what doors are just simply dangerously open. Help us to recognize that our opportunities can also be our liabilities. And help us to know your will, to trust your ways, to wait to see your plans fulfilled. God, I pray a blessing over every person hearing this message. And God, it may be that some of us have some people we need to confess we've stolen a pen or we've stolen books we've stolen copper nails we've moved outside of your ways God what an incredible day this could be if we'd be willing to put aside that which we feel like we're entitled to and wait 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 for that which you've promised We ask this prayer in the mighty name, the name above all names, the name of Jesus. And God's people said, amen, amen. Thank you for your presence here. Go and be Jesus with skin on for others.